Welcome back to this series on neural network programming with PyTorch. In this video, we're going to introduce CUDA at a high level. The goal of this post is to help beginners understand what CUDA is and how it fits in with PyTorch, and more importantly, why we even use GPUs in neural network programming in the first place. Without further ado, let's get started. To understand CUDA, we need to have a working knowledge of graphics processing units, or GPUs. A GPU is a processor that is good at handling specialized computations. This is in contrast to a central processing unit, or CPU, which is a processor that is good at handling general computations. CPUs are the processors that power most of the typical computations on our electronic devices. A GPU can be much faster at computing than a CPU. However, this is not always the case. The speed of a GPU relative to a CPU depends on the type of computation being performed. The type of computation most suitable for a GPU is a computation that can be done in parallel. This brings us to parallel computing. Parallel computing is a type of computation whereby a particular computation is broken into independent, smaller computations that can be carried out simultaneously. The resulting computations are then recombined or synchronized to form the result of the original larger computation. The number of tasks that a larger computation can be broken into depends on the number of cores contained on a particular piece of hardware. Cores are the units that actually do the computation with Within a given processor, and CPUs typically have 4, 8, or 16 cores, while GPUs have potentially thousands of cores. There are other technical specifications that matter, but this description is meant to drive the general idea. With this working knowledge, we can conclude that parallel computing is done using GPUs. We can also conclude that tasks which are best suited to be solved using a GPU are tasks that can be done in parallel. If a computation can be done in parallel, we can accelerate our computation using parallel programming approaches in GPUs. Let's turn our attention now to neural networks and see why GPUs are so heavily used in deep learning. We have just seen that GPUs are well suited for parallel computing, and this fact about GPUs is why deep learning uses them. Neural networks are embarrassingly parallel. You gotta be kidding me. Seriously, in parallel computing, an embarrassingly parallel task is a problem where little to no effort is needed to break the task down into an independent set of smaller tasks. Neural networks are embarrassingly parallel, and GPUs typically have 3,000, like high-end GPUs have 3,000 cores that can run computations in parallel. Many of the computations we do in neural networks can indeed be easily broken into smaller computations that are independent with respect to one another. So it's the nature of computations used in neural networks that makes GPUs so useful in deep learning. Let's look at an example computation that's often used in deep learning, the convolution operation. This animation showcases the convolution process without numbers. We have an input channel in blue on the bottom, a convolutional filter shaded on top of the input channel that is sliding across the input channel, and a green output channel. For each position of the convolutional filter on top of the input channel, there is a corresponding green region on the output channel. This is the output of the convolution operation at each point. In the animation, these computations are happening sequentially, one after the other. However, each computation is independent from the others. This means that none of the computations depend on the results of any of the other computations. As a result, all of these independent computations can happen in parallel on a GPU, and the overall output channel can then be produced after all of the computations have been completed. This allows us to see that the convolution operation can be accelerated using a parallel programming approach and a GPU. This is where CUDA comes into play. What NVIDIA's GPU computing approach pioneered was the entire stack thinking, from architecture to processor to systems, system software, APIs, libraries, and application solvers. We optimize across the entire stack, one domain at a time. One domain at a time. 
and it is incredibly hard work, and that's one of the reasons why it's taken us almost 10 years. NVIDIA is a technology company that designs GPUs, and they have created CUDA as a software platform that pairs with their GPU hardware, making it easier for developers to build software that accelerates computations using the parallel processing power of NVIDIA GPUs. An NVIDIA GPU is the hardware that enables parallel computations, while CUDA is the software layer that provides an API for developers. Developers, 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 developers. Developers, 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 developers. Yes! As a result, you might have guessed that an NVIDIA GPU is required to use CUDA. Once you have an NVIDIA GPU, CUDA can be downloaded and installed from NVIDIA's website for free. Developers use CUDA by downloading the CUDA toolkit, and with the toolkit come specialized libraries like QDNN, the CUDA Deep Learning Neural Network Library. The stack, GPU computing, basically works in several ways. The first step, of course, is to build an amazing GPU. That's the first step. The first step is building an amazing GPU. The second step is to create the libraries for that domain. The system software, the systems architecture, the APIs, and the libraries, accelerated libraries for that domain. And in the case of high-performance computing, it's linear algebra, it's FFTs, it's all kinds of different types of libraries, and we have all of the libraries created. And now with deep learning, QDNN, and with inference, TensorRT, the libraries are in place. The third step is to work with all of the application developers, the solvers, technical teams, work hand-in-hand -hand to accelerate, to refactor their algorithms of their application and run it on our libraries. With PyTorch, CUDA comes baked in from the start. There are no additional downloads required. Yeah. All we need is to have a supported NVIDIA GPU, and we can leverage CUDA using PyTorch. We don't need to know how to use the CUDA API directly. Now, if we wanted to work on the PyTorch core development team or write PyTorch extensions, it would definitely be useful to know how to use CUDA directly. Much of PyTorch is written in Python. However, at bottleneck points, PyTorch drops into C, C++, and CUDA to speed up processing and get that performance boost yeah. We fight it in various ways. One of the simplest ways is we just move all of our functions to C, C, C or C++ that are actually important. Um, it's a subtle trade-off because uh, as users of PyTorch itself, you want to make sure it's very easy to debug and extend while you're working with it day to day. But if you want performance, then the biggest hotspots cannot be in Python. So the reason we went down Python, like instead of using C++ directly, why we went to use Python is because Python is the most popular data science language. But we have to make these constant trade-offs and fight Python all the time. I'm in a Jupyter Notebook now, and I want to show you how to use CUDA with PyTorch. Taking advantage of CUDA is extremely easy with PyTorch. If we want a particular computation to be performed on the GPU, we can instruct PyTorch to do so by calling the CUDA function on our data structures. Suppose we have the following code. We assign T to be equal to a new torch.tensor. We'll learn more about this in future videos. For now, let's just focus on the tensor output. So we see the tensor output. We have a tensor with three elements, the numbers one, two, and three. The tensor object created in this way is on the CPU by default. As a result, any operations that we do using this tensor object will be carried out on the CPU. Now, if we want to move this tensor onto the GPU, we just write t.cuda. Calling the CUDA function on a tensor returns the same tensor, but on the GPU. So after running this code and we look at the tensor output, we have the same tensor with three elements, one, two, and three, but we also have a device specified. And this is what happens whenever the device is not the CPU. We actually get the value in the output. So we can see that our device is CUDA zero. The zero stands for the first index. And the reason for this is that PyTorch supports multiple Multiple GPUs. So if you had multiple GPUs, you could put this tensor on a particular GPU. This ability makes PyTorch very versatile because computations can be selectively carried out either on the CPU or on the GPU. With that being said, I want to talk to you about a looming question. We said that we can selectively run our computations on the GPU or on the CPU, but why not just run every computation on the GPU? Isn't a GPU faster than a CPU? The answer is that a GPU is only faster for particular specialized tasks. 
One issue that we can run into is bottlenecks that slow our performance. For example, moving data from the CPU to the GPU is costly. So when we do this, the overall performance might be slower if the computation task is a simple one. Moving relatively small computational tasks to the GPU won't speed us up very much and may indeed slow us down. Remember, the GPU works well for tasks that can be broken into many smaller tasks. And if the compute task is already small, we won't have much to gain by breaking it up and moving it to the GPU. For this reason, it's often acceptable to simply use a CPU, especially when just starting out. And as we tackle larger, more complicated problems, we can begin using the GPU more heavily. In the beginning, the main tasks that were accelerated using GPUs were computer graphics tasks, hence the name graphics processing unit. But in recent years, many more varieties of parallel tasks have emerged. One such task, as we have seen, is the task of training neural networks for deep learning. Deep learning, along with many other scientific computing tasks that use parallel programming techniques, are leading to a new type of programming model called GPGPU, or General Purpose GPU Computing. NVIDIA has been a pioneer in this space. NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang has envisioned GPU computing very early on, which is why CUDA was created nearly 10 years ago. Even though CUDA has been around for a long time, it's just now beginning to really take flight. And NVIDIA's work on CUDA up until now is why NVIDIA is leading the way in terms of GPU computing for deep learning. When we hear Jensen talk about the GPU computing stack, he is referring to the GPU as the hardware on the bottom, CUDA as the software architecture on the top of the GPU, and finally, libraries like QDNN on top of CUDA. This GPU computing stack is what supports the general purpose computing capabilities on a chip that is otherwise very specialized. We often see stacks like this in computer science as technology is built in layers. Sitting on top of CUDA and QDNN in this stack is PyTorch, which is the framework we'll be working with that ultimately supports applications on top. The paper I'm showing here takes a deep dive into GPU programming and CUDA, but it goes much deeper than we need. We will be working near the top of the stack here with PyTorch. However, it's beneficial to have a bird's eye view of just where we're operating within the overall stack. We are ready now to jump in with section two of this neural network programming series, which is all about tensors. Remember to check the blog for this video on deeplizard.com and don't forget to check out the Deep Lizard Hive Mind for exclusive perks and rewards. Thanks for watching and supporting collective intelligence. I'll see you in the next one. Computing is the most important invention of humanity. It is the single most important tool that we have ever created. Over the last 25 years, the computer has advanced in performance 100,000 times. Scientists and researchers are at the brink of discovering solutions for precision medicine. They're at the brink of being able to solve weather prediction and understanding climate. We're at the brink of being able to discover the next groundbreaking material that's light and strong or new ways of store energy. We're at the brink of discovering a way for machines to operate themselves. We're at the brink of discovering artificial intelligence.